Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Anika Gordon Dillon from the Animal Health Unit of the Division of Food Production, Fisheries and Forestry in Tobago. I am here today to talk to you about treatable diseases of swine. Let us begin. because pigs are affected by a lot of diseases. Many of them are viruses, many of them pigs die from, but there are a handful of them that we as farmers and vets can do something about. So that is the reason why I chose treatable diseases. So we have a few topics of interest that I want to go through before we actually start. We want to look at what constitutes a healthy pig, and then I want to break down the treatable diseases into three groups, the in three periods, the pre-weaning period, the post-weaning period, and the breeding period. So a healthy pig is one that has a good appetite. That pig is normally vigorous, is bright, is lively. The feces tend to be semi-solid, not diarrhea, so no scars and no hard balls. Balls actually show dehydration and they normally have a regular temperature of around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's important to have healthy pigs because healthy pigs reflect a successful herd. It shows increased production and more selling and profit for the farmer. All staff working with pigs should be able to spot simple symptoms of common diseases, which we're going to discuss today. They're very easy to identify. And once you've identified these symptoms, you want to alert a manager or a veterinarian. And then the next step is to apply the suitable medication. So right here, I'm comparing a healthy pig to a sick pig. And it's very visible with the pictures, but in case if there is any discrepancy, let us talk about what are some of the possible signs of illnesses that we could see with a pig. So some pigs that are sick tend to vocalize. Um, they may do that through grunting, through bawling. Some tend to isolate themselves from others, especially if they're being bullied, if they're the weaker ones. Um, they may there are times when you could see the pale and droopy eyes. eyes. You Some tend to feel like back in the pen, so they have lost all of their bullied if they the refuse to move. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the other more visible signs, such as a poor con body condition, or if it's a disease that manifests through the skin, you will see abnormal skin discoloration. Okay. So, a treatable disease basically is a disease where the use of medication, whether it be antibiotics or, you know, a spray would cause a change or effect a change in the condition of the animal so that the animal is better or even more comfortable than it was before. And as I said, we're going to divide them into three periods. We have the pre-weaning period, post-weaning period, and the breeding period. So in the pre-weaning period, we're looking at piglets up to about eight weeks. Some farmers will wean them earlier, even four weeks or six weeks, but we'll be discussing up to eight weeks for this pre-weaning period. And four main treatable diseases that I wanted to look at today, there are others, but these are the ones that I chose. We have anemia, we have greasy pig disease, coccidiosis, and scarring. So anemia. So anemia is basically iron deficiency and piglets are supposed to be given iron within the first week of life. When a piglet is anemic, we could spot it right away. Most times they would be on thrifty in appearance. They would have pale skin. They would have reduced or uneven growth. Many times in the litter, you will be seeing small ones, larger ones, their hair coat very rough and some of them move very slow and this predisposes them to crushing. So the sow's milk does not contain sufficient iron. 
So the piglets need that iron injection. And this is, as I said, is given in the first week of life. They usually get one mil of iron in the neck muscles. For other pigs, such as roaming pigs or wild hogs, we don't tend to concern ourselves with iron as much because they get this from naturally foraging in the soil. So we'll move on to greasy pig disease. So greasy pig disease is an exudative dermatitis. And basically what that means is that things are coming up on the skin. The skin has a wrinkly, very greasy feel. You will have scabs peeling off and coming off in your hands. And the skin has a dark appearance. Sometimes it only starts from the head or neck. It could stay there or it could cover the entire body and this infection is caused by staphylococcus hycus all right the treatment for this is very simple it's a penicillin injection most of the time we tend to use the long acting but if you're using the short acting penicillin just remember that you have to the, the, the time is only 12 hours and you will have to repeat it accordingly all right here is a picture showing some pigs that have been infected with greasy pig disease. This one on the left, we see where even for some pigs, the eyes are shut, the nasal cavity are, is blocked. You know, all these things will make it difficult for the piglet to feed and eventually they die from starvation or from secondary bacterial infection or mixed infection. Right. It could easily be prevented. And many of these diseases that we're talking about today, there I have a section of how it could be prevented because I think it is important for farmers to know. And if they come about, then the second line of defense would obviously be treatment, but prevention is very, very important. So we want to make sure that the hygiene in the piglet house is up to par. We want to use a farm grade sanitizer. I love TH4. You want to make sure that the piglet house is sanitized before and after farrowing. Make sure you've removed all the, the, um, the placenta or any debris and make sure you sanitize that piglet house very good. You want to prevent sharp objects and rough floors from causing abrasions because it's through these skin abrasions that the bacteria enters the skin of the piglets. Right? So we are moving on quite quickly to coccidiosis. This is an intracellular parasite that infects piglets between 10 and 21 days, but it could also affect them up to 15 weeks. The diarrhea may or may not be accompanied with blood and secondary bacterial infection is what really causes a prolonged recovery with this. Treatments are very simple. We tend to use a coccidiostat. One of the popular ones is amprolium, or we could use a sulfur jug as an injectable, right? Prevention, right? The sow's feces is the main source of infection. So if you don't clean your pen, if you don't wash down your pen often and you have the sow feces that has coccidiosis, when you have animal carriers coming into the pen, such as dog, rodents, and birds, they act as physical transmittance of the oocyst, right? So we have to remember that coccidiosis is a species-specific infection, but the presence of these animal carriers are going to act physically to transmit the oocyst. So generally, we want to keep the pen clean. I know it's very difficult to control birds, especially for a pig pen, you know, and this is where it becomes very difficult. And so keeping the pen clean and limiting feces within the pen, the pen is what is really going to help to prevent this disease, right? So we could move on to scoring, and scoring is a little different from coccidiosis. Scoring is usually caused by bacteria um, in the environment. One of the most common bacteria is the E. coli, and this diarrhea tends to be a white or yellow diarrhea. It's highly contagious. It happens in the first week of life, and these piglets tend to be more susceptible to crushing because they're so weak from dehydration. Right, the treatment for scoring, your oral antibiotic. I like Scorban. It has a stomach protectant in it and they tend to recover faster. 
the other option is also injectable antibiotics such as penicillin. And we come back to prevention, of course, which is the improving of hygiene in the piglet house. And you also want to make sure that you provide a warm, stress-free environment. Stress causes immune suppression, which leaves them open to infection of all different kinds. Okay, so let's go to the post weaning period. This period is we're looking at is between eight to 15 weeks. So we'll be looking at respiratory diseases, swine dysentery, and erysipelas. Well, respiratory diseases are usually fatal in pigs. Um, we normally see them in finishing pigs. And the problem with the respiratory diseases is that it's normally a mixed infection. So we don't usually see one agent. Um, poor ventilation, overcrowding, stress, poor hygiene, all these things, you know, act to, to, to increase ammonia levels in the pen. And the increase in the ammonia levels in the pen is what irritates the respiratory tract and allow, allows the bacteria to invade, right? So prevention obviously would be improving ventilation and reducing stress, as I said, because stress causes immunocompromising right um your treatment would be a little bit more difficult for respiratory diseases because as i said you have many causative agents so the antibiotic that's being used would have to be sensitive to the causative agents right and the antibiotics could either be administered in the feed the water or as an injectable so dysentery so swine dysentery normally presents as a bloody score and affects piglets, I mean, sorry, pigs between the age of eight to 14. It actually has a mortality rate of 30%. And it's important that we don't confuse swine dysentery with diet-related diarrhea that occurs days after weaning. So when you've brought the pigs into a new environment, which is stress, and you have them on this new diet, they tend to get a diet-related diarrhea, but this is within the first 10 days. There's no blood in it, and there is usually no mortality that is associated with this diet. So it's very important to differentiate the two. Um, some signs of swine dysentery include bloody diarrhea, a stained rectum, um, they would be isolated, some will, will shiver, you will have reduced or uneven growth rate between the litter that you weaned, and in some cases you do have sudden death, right? Some of the causes of swine dysentery would be high stocking density, this causes stress, and this actually increases the amount of fecal load in a certain area and most often time relates to poor hygiene, right? Rodents could also act as vectors and also no quarantine enough new stock, which is when you buy a new animal, you don't quarantine them and you introduce them to your herd, you could actually be bringing in swine dysentery. Right, so it's very, very important when you buy that animal to have that animal quarantined from the others. Usually we like to use a period of 14 days. You observe them, once they're good, then you could add them to your flock. Okay, so we let's talk about erysipelas. So erysipelas normally affects pigs that are older. We're talking about pigs older than 12 weeks. And we normally see them in pens where the, the, the flooring is dirt rather than it's concrete, right? It's caused by the bacterium erysipelothrix. And for this um, disease, it's very easy to detect. They have skin lesions that appear as red blotches on the skin. And there is a classic diamond shape that is represented by this disease. Some of the animals have a reluctance to move or to get up. Um, but most of the time, the complaint from the farmer would be he sees these things coming out on the skin. And then when you go there, they either are you know, lucky to see a diamond shape or you could recognize the red blotches on the skin, right? So here we have the diamond shape lesions here. 
shown very clearly, right? But some pigs, you will only see red blotches on the skin. You may or may not see the diamond-shaped lesions, right? Now, there could also be secondary bacterial infection around these lesions and ulcers could also develop and this worsens the prognosis. It's a longer treatment course on antibiotics. In some cases, you have to use skin creams or sprays and it just becomes very difficult to control. In chronic stages, um, the pigs tend to show arthritis and there could be death from heart failure. The treatment is injectable antibiotics, such as penicillin. So let's move on to the breeding period. So these are pigs that would be older than 20 weeks, right? So these are breeding pigs. So we're going to look at some things that would occur during these periods. Um, mastitis, metritis, external parasites, internal parasites. Okay, let's look at mastitis. So mastitis is a bacterial infection of the mammary glands. Most of the time, those bacteria tend to be coliform bacteria um, that is found in feces in the environment such as E. coli and Klebsiella. And the mammary glands become discolored. Most of the time when you touch the tissue, it's a higher body temperature than the rest of the body. Some cells tend to develop a fever or some will just have the mammary tissue feeling very hot, right? The cells tend not to eat and overall there is a reduced milk production. And the picture on top shows a nice teeth presentation, evenly spaced, nice um, teeth hair, nice areola, nice development hair. On the bottom, we see a more gangrene development in the mastitis, right? This would be very painful. Um, this sort of presentation may not be hot. This may actually be more cool because gangrene tends to lose a lot of blood flow. Right, prevention with mastitis is very easy and it's actually twofold, well, threefold. We have, we have to manage the environment we have to manage stress in the soil, and we actually have a feed management component to mastitis. So the hygiene in the farrowing pen needs to be top notch, and we need to reduce her stress while she's pregnant, limit noise, limit you know human interaction, just a very quiet, peaceful place while she's pregnant. We also have the feed management side of it, where we actually want to decrease the caloric intake of the sow. So two days before farrowing, we decrease the feed to one to 1.5 kilograms of feed per day of mixed feed. And then after now, we would increase by 0.5 kilograms per day until it reached to five kilograms, which is their maximum amount of mixed feed. The reason for this is because if you continue her on the same feeding pattern, the mammary tissue is going to develop in such a way for some cells, it tends to hang very pendulous on the floor. You could pick up um, feces, you pick up infection, they could get scratches and you don't want too much milk being produced at the beginning, being stored there with the teeth possibly open and leaving room for infection. So we really want to manage the feed and also we want to manage their body condition leading up to farrowing, making sure they're not too conditioned. Right? Let us talk about metritis. So metritis is most common post farrowing. Why? because the cervix is open and that leaves room for bacteria to enter um, into the womb, right? Treatments for metritis normally include injectable antibiotics such as your penicillins, your trimethoprim sulfur, your ceftio 4 but also if the infection is not that severe, what we could do is use an antibiotic insert into the uterus. So first what we want to do is to wash out the uterus with an antiseptic. I like chlorhexidine. So we use three parts chlorhexidine to two parts water and you are going to flush the uterus until all the antibiotic is out. 
normally I use um, a blunt tip hose at a low enough pressure to help to flush out the antiseptic right and then after you flush out the antiseptic then you insert the the uterus antibiotic so here's a diagram showing how um mma could develop so we're looking at noise or anything that could be stressful during the farrowing period this would cause an increase in cortisol cortisol your stress hormone you depress the immune system once you depress the immune system you're Kanish, and again, I'll call you.
Okay. We had some technical difficulties, so we're going to start back. Um, we were talking about metritis. So metritis is normally common post far away. And this causes an inflammation of the womb because the cervix is still open. So that leaves room for bacterial infection to enter. And I'm not on. All right, just now.
Right. Resuming where we left off, we were talking about metritis, right? This is common post farrowing. And as mentioned before, this is where bacteria enters the room through an open cervix. And treatment for metritis includes antibiotics such as penicillin, um, trimethoprim sulfur, septiophore, but we could also use antibiotic inserts. The best way to utilize antibiotic inserts is after you've washed the uterus. I like to use the antiseptic chlorhexidine, three parts chlorhexidine to two parts water, and we're going to flush the uterus until all the antiseptic is out, and then you insert the antibiotic. Right. So let's look at all the different ways that MMA could come about in the cell. So noise or stress in the environment during the farrowing period tends to increase cortisol um, secretion. Cortisol, the stress hormone, would cause a decreased immune system. And once you see the immune system is decreased, then that leaves room for the pig to become infected. Also, oxytocin tends to decrease. Now, oxytocin is responsible for the contraction of the uterus to help to expel discharges that may remain after the sow has given birth. And so imagine these discharges remain in the, in the uterus and the bacteria just grows and invades, especially how the cervix is open. And that is basically the best recipe for metritis. For mastitis, um, we want to look at external things as well. We want to look at a slippery floor. We want to look at a very rough floor, things that could cause abrasions to the nipple, right? If the pen is always dirty, then we have fecal matter and bacteria that could enter through the teeth canal, and that is how you could get your mastitis coming in. Right. So let's talk about MMA. As we discussed before, it's basically a complex syndrome that can occur from 12 hours to three days after farrowing. We look at metritis, we look at mastitis, and now we also have agalactia, which is the reduction or total loss of milk that comes into play. And the bad thing about MMA is that often we don't detect this until we start to see the litter showing signs of hunger or weight loss. And so you might have a very noisy batch of piglets, you know, they may be restless, um, some may be weak and you may be experiencing crushing. And then you decide, okay, let me check the saw. And then when you check, she has no milk, she has metritis and she has mastitis, right? So MMA is predisposed in fat cells. These are cells with a body condition of four plus. That's why we stress not to overfeed the cells and we want to limit their caloric intake as we had discussed earlier. Um, two days before farrowing to prevent the, the mammary tissue from enlarging, from engorging too much with milk. We want to exercise good hygiene in the farrowing pen to limit the exposure to bacteria that cause the metritis or the mastitis. We want to ensure that the breeding cell has 15 to 30 liters of clean water daily. This is very, very important. Um, and what I always tell farmers, Yes, we want to treat the sow because we're going to give her antibiotic injection. We're going to make sure she's comfortable. But you now have to switch your mind and your gears to making sure that these piglets survive because these are the units basically from your farm. So we will have to employ strategies for hand feeding in most cases because there's a galactia where there is no milk. So farmers now have to look at ways to feed these piglets. So we have goat milk replacer which is actually much richer than the cow's milk. We could also use diluted condensed milk, one to three parts water, or we could use the homemade formula, which I prefer with cow's milk. So we use 600 ml of cow's milk, one egg yolk, cod liver oil, and some form of acid. And some people might be acid. Why acid? It's actually very important to add an acid component because it helps to break down the milk and that would mimic enzymes that were already in the sour's milk. Two, it also helps to increase digestibility of the milk, as I said before, with the breaking down of the milk. It's actually more palatable to the piglets 
and it also helps to create an environment that would keep out bacteria such as E. coli that would otherwise cause scars, right? So adding a little bit of lime juice or a little bit of vinegar ensures we don't get any scars and ensure that the piglets actually drink more milk because it's more palatable and um, it's more digestible for them, right? And a regular um, bottle is fine. Um, we just want to make sure that the hole is not too big. We want to butter feed for the first three to five days every four to five hours. And normally a piglet can drink anywhere from um, one to maybe four ounces, depending on its capacity. So if you notice the piglet is only drinking one ounce of milk, you probably want to increase the frequency of the feed, right? Tray feeding, we'd want to introduce tray feeding after 10 days, and we want to try to add things to the milk because after a while the milk is not sufficient for their growth. And we have different options for additives, and this would just depend on, um, your financial situation or say how many piglets that you're trying to feed so we have chicken starter we could use we have cream of wheat and oats we have wheat germ and fine processed cornmeal we want to make sure we soak these right and we have baby cereal which is actually a favorite of mine um, and i prefer the brand nutribomb it's easily digestible it dissolves very well and i find the piglets grow very very good on it right internal parasites so usually these parasites tend to be worms such as whipworms tapeworms and stomach worms and most often parasites are spread through the fecal oral route that's from feces to mouth right we have signs of parasites diarrhea loss of appetite poor body conditions stunted growth rough hair coat but most importantly, we want to look for that black tarry stool. Some parasites could actually burrow to the walls of the intestine, causing ulcers or causing bleeding, and that digested blood comes out as like a sticky, tarry, molassy kind of stool. Anytime you're seeing that, you definitely know that there are some parasites in play, and we want to treat with that as quickly as possible. Treatment with antiparasitic drug, my drug of choice would be ivermectin, which is given as an injectable. I don't normally give oral ivermectin to pigs. Piperazine or wazine, as the older folks like to call it, can also be used. But this mostly targets your round worms, like your ascaris and your nodule worms, um, which is be in the esophagus. Lung worms, liver worms, kidney worms, those other worms, you don't really get to target that with piperazine, but I find it's good for a very broad treatment and it's easy to use. So the best way to use piperazine, you want to treat the cells four weeks before farrowing, so it can be used during gestation. And you want to also treat your piglets five weeks of age. So if you know you're going to wean your piglets at around Six weeks, you could give that to them, or some people actually choose to give it to them after they've weaned them. And then after you've given the piglets their first dose of piperazine, you want to do two months intervals, right? External parasites. We're looking at things like hog laws, we're looking at things like mange, and basically the external parasites, they make the animals so uncomfortable that there is a reduced overall performance. The animal itches all the time, it consumes its whole day with just body itching and scratching and, you know, there it, it's, it really, really affects the animal's, you know, happiness. You, you could see that the animal is uncomfortable. Um, another thing that is implicated with this is secondary bacterial infection that you now have to come and treat with antibiotic or treat with sprays. So you really want to get a handle on these things. Um, the normal treatment would be the insecticide, the Amitra sprays that you spray on the animal and you actually spray in the environment to kill the organism in the environment. And of course, we could use the ivermectin injectable, right? So the mange, when an animal has a really, really heavy infestation of mange, you want to quarantine that pig, you want to isolate that pig from everybody because it's highly contagious. If you have a boar with mange and you put it to, um, 
to breed the sow, the sow will pick up mange from that boar. The signs of mange, you will see air shaking, you will see rubbing the skin on the walls of the pen as described before. And sometimes you see a general thickness and flaking of the skin by the air, the neck and the flank. And you have to remember, it's very important to treat the animal and the environment, right? So we see here a boar with this overall thickened skin, very inflamed. Um, this boar would be very, very uncomfortable. Right, so in conclusion, basically what I want, what I want you to take from this is that you want to provide an environment in which the disease causing agents find it difficult to thrive. You know, uh, try to keep the environment as sanitized as possible, as clean as possible, as dry as possible. Don't have anything sticking out of the pen that will scratch the animal and, you know, leave um, room for bacterial invasion. You know, um, just really try to pay attention to the environment and whatever you could do to secure the environment in a way that is better for pig production would be good, right? Prevention is better than cure, always we say. So for every disease, I've outlined multiple ways at which you could prevent the disease. Because if you could prevent the disease in the beginning, then there is no reason to implement treatment, right? Good biosecurity is also good to prevent treatment. And your biosecurity measures is basically just to help keeping out those infective agents that would be causing these diseases. Quarantine before introduction to the herd, also very, very important. Some farmers bring in so many diseases with these animals that they purchase and just simply quarantining these animals and even treating them with routine things would prevent so many things from being introduced to your herd. And lastly, remain observant, remain vigilant. You know, um, if you see something off, it, it's not by coincidence, don't say you're going to watch it until the next day. It's better to report and respond as quickly as possible. You could prevent something highly contagious from spreading and just picking over your entire herd, right? These are my references. Thank you, and I will be attending to all questions now. For more information after this, I do encourage you to call the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab in Tobago. The services that we have available include the Veterinary Ambulatory Service. We also have artificial insemination available there, and we also have veterinary diagnostics available, blood tests, fecal tests. Um, so give us a call, especially if you're in Tobago, you're a farmer that would need any of these services, I do encourage you to call. I'm taking questions. Okay. So, can coccidiosis get in the air was a question. Um, can viruses move by wind? Can coccidia come into the air? Um, well, coccidia is not a virus. It's an intracellular parasite. It's not a worm. It's not a bacterium. It's a parasite. Um, it's a protozoa, and so basically it's transmitted to the fecal oral roots. Um, I would have mentioned that um, the, the most infective um, material in the pen for coccidia would be the sow species. So anything that touches the sow species and then brings that, you know, over to the feed or over to the water, such as the birds, the rats, these animals that you know would frequent the pen would cause transmission of the coccidia um, to the piglets, right? But no, 
to answer your question, no. You would not get coccidia in the air and can viruses move by wind. I think this is probably related to the, the coccidia question. Right, so basically we just want to prevent contact with the feces and keeping the pen clean, washing down as frequently, even sometimes dry scraping and sanitizing. I know some farmers don't have access to as much water. I find dry scraping and um, a light spray with the TH4 sanitizer works very well. Once you don't have that infective agent in the pen, then you lessen the transmission of the parasites. Yeah. Um, that was the only um, question I I found that was, yeah. Okay, so, right, so thank you very much for joining me. I hope the information was um, beneficial. Um, as I said, I chose treatable diseases of swine because I wanted to highlight diseases that, you know, farmers or, you know, we could do something about. Um, sometimes we have these discussions about some diseases that we never see or that we can't do anything about, but knowing how to, to treat them and even to prevent them in the first place, I think is, is very important moving forward. Um, I really enjoyed um, giving the presentation and I hope I can have the next opportunity like this in the future. Okay.